Hey, my name's Steve Hall, and I want to thank you for joining our Bible study today. Before we get into today's Bible study, I would like to invite you to come to check out our Standing Firm Bible study class in person. We're at Fairview Baptist Tabernacle in Sweetwater, Tennessee. We meet in the downstairs fellowship hall of the auditorium building at 10.15 a.m. on Sunday mornings immediately after the 9 o'clock worship service. Here's a little map for you. See the little red lines? <laughs> Notice if you're in the auditorium, just follow those red arrows. If you're in the back, go straight down that hallway behind you to the stairwell. If you're near the front of the auditorium, you can go out the left door, and I mean left as you're sitting in the auditorium looking toward the pulpit and the choir. Go to your left, go out that door, all the way down to the end of the hall, keep to your left, all the way down to the stairwell, then turn right and go down the stairwell. We meet in the fellowship hall around the tables near the kitchen downstairs. If you have trouble with stairs, there are men driving golf carts near the entrance to the auditorium building at the crossover there who will be glad to give you a ride to a door that enters the building on our level so you won't have to do any steps at all. We're a co-educational class, men and women both invited. We're for all ages, doesn't matter how old or how young. Children and youth are certainly welcome, but some children and youth actually prefer to go to the children and youth classes, which meet at the same time we meet, more on their level. Dress, totally casual. Class members are certainly encouraged to participate in the Bible study, ask questions, engage in conversation. But listen, if you happen to be kind of shy, we promise we're not going to embarrass you. We're not going to ask you to read. We're not going to ask you to pray. We're not going to ask you any specific questions directed to you. <laughs> It isn't unusual for class members who are kind of shy just to not say anything at all once class gets started. So that's your choice. So I'm just saying, please don't feel intimidated if you happen to be the shy type. I know sometimes the first meeting is kind of tough for the shy people. But there's never been a time when it's been more important for God's people to meet in small Bible study fellowship groups in order to encourage each other. We, we've got to stand firm in his truth. We've got to stand firm on his word. These are very confusing days we're living in. You know that. So we'd love for you to join us and just see for yourself what God's doing in our class. If you'd like more information, go to AboundingJoy.com. There's the web address right there on the screen. You can click on the Standing Firm Bible Class menu item when you get there. You may want to hit pause right now or do a screen save to get, make sure you get the spelling right, but you can learn more information about us there. Now here's today's Bible study. I hope and pray it helps you grow stronger in our Lord Jesus Christ and in your knowledge of His Word and of his will for your life. Well, hey guys, thanks for joining me in Bible study again today. We're looking at Paul's introduction to this incredible, wonderful letter to the Romans. This is our fifth study in the book of Romans since we started this series. We covered four verses in the first four weeks. <laughs> and the book of Romans has 16 chapters, 433 verses. <laughs> so, if we maintain the pace we've been going at for the past four weeks, we'll finish sometime maybe in August of 2033, I calculated. I did that also including weeks set apart for David to teach us maybe the basics of the Christian life. So <laughs> there you go. Hope you're ready for a long, long haul. I really don't think we're going to keep moving so slowly through the entire book as we have been, but, but we're not in a hurry, right? Why be in a hurry? There's no need to hurry. So let's read Paul's introduction again. That would be the first seven verses of chapter one. And today we're going to focus on verses five, six, and seven. Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures concerning his son, who was descended from David according to the flesh and was declared to be the Son of God in power according to the Spirit of holiness by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord, through whom we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith for the sake of his name among all the nations, including you who are called to belong to Jesus Christ, to all those in Rome 
who are loved by God and called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Such incredible words, so, so full of incredible things. In verse 5, Paul uses for the very first time in this letter the word grace, through whom we have received grace. Now, if someone were to ask you to tell them what that word means, in other words, suppose someone's here from another country, says, I'm trying to learn this English language, I come across this new word, it's grace. Can you explain it to me? What, what's this word mean? Well, we could go down some different roads and different directions of explaining what the word might mean in different contexts, but one of the most common definitions, I think a very good definition of grace, is unmerited favor, undeserved, unmerited favor. Favor, unworked for favor, unearned favor. The Greek word is charis, charis. It's used 147 times in the New Testament. Paul himself uses it 96 of those 147 times in his letters. And he uses it 21 times here in this letter uh, to the Romans. In fact, if we had to summarize all of Paul's letters with just one word, <laughs> This would probably be the word you'd choose, right? Grace, grace, grace to you. And when we hear that word grace, I believe we ought to be wired in such a way that the word gift should come quickly to our minds. Gift, as in free gift. You remember what he said in Ephesians? For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not of your own doing. It is the gift of God, the gift of God, not a result of works so that no one may boast. Maybe you've heard people in the past try to explain the difference between the words grace and mercy. Those are two really big Bible words, aren't they? And they're kind of similar in our minds. Have you ever heard this? Grace is God giving us what we don't deserve. <laughs> so it is by His grace that we have eternal life. We didn't deserve eternal life. It is by His grace we have forgiveness. We didn't deserve that. It is by His grace that we have sonship in His family. We are His kids. We don't deserve that. Those are gifts from God. Mercy, on the other hand, is God not giving us what we do deserve. Have you heard that definition of mercy? So it is by His mercy that we have not been destroyed. It is by His mercy that we don't have eternal death, hell, damnation. We deserve those things, but we don't get them because of His mercy. Most of the time, we think of grace and talk about grace, I think, as Christians, in terms of our first coming to Christ. You know, one of our favorite verses that we use when we share the gospel is Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. I already shared that with you. For by grace, by grace, you've been saved. We come to Christ through grace. It's not of our own doing. It's the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. They're wonderful words. We're saved by grace through faith. And we like to talk about that. We like to stress that. It's very important. We don't want to ever unstress it. We don't want to minimize it. It's not on the basis of our works. It's not on the basis of our efforts. It is a gift. And since it is a gift, there's really nothing we can do to deserve it or add to it. Do you understand what I'm saying? We, we just receive a gift, right? We receive God's goodness, God's gift with an attitude of thanksgiving. Here's an illustration that may help with that a little bit. Suppose you have a special birthday coming up. And suppose you've got a friend, a human friend, who loves you so much that he wants to give you a fabulous gift. And so he works an extra job to make some extra money so he can buy you this incredible gift. He scrimps and he saves and he puts away his money. You may not have a human friend like this, but <laughs> pretend. And, and he spends a ridiculous amount of money on this fabulous gift that he wants you to have. So finally, the big day comes, your birthday, and he gathers you and your family and friends around, and he unveils this spectacular gift for you. This is grace. All you can do is say breathlessly, thank you. Thank you so much. You're overwhelmed, right? Wouldn't it be ridiculous if you said, wow, that's really nice. Here, let me help you out a little bit. Here's a couple of bucks to help pay for it. That would be an insult, wouldn't it? And that's kind of what we do to God when we say, Lord, I know you've given me this grace, but I also know I have to kind of earn this, right, with my good works. Our good works, he says, are like filthy rags. We can't 
earn our salvation. We can't earn God's grace. That's the very definition of grace. It is a gift. So we don't offer God anything to help pay for it. That's just silly when you think about it. We do live a life of good works, but they're not to pay for salvation. Our good works are a result of the salvation that's already been given to us as a gift. You get that, right? So, for example, going back to your friend, after receiving that lavish gift from your friend, you might find yourself, probably would find yourself, doing all you can to express your gratitude as the days and years go by. You'd be very grateful to that friend. In the same way, we live our lives in gratitude for God for what he did for us on the day we first trusted Jesus when he gave us his grace. There was a former president of Princeton University back in the days when their presidents were Christians. And he said, when I was a young man, I received the gift of eternal life from my Lord Jesus Christ. He said, it was a gift. There's nothing I could do to earn it. But he said, all my life since that day has been like a PS to a letter in which I've tried to say thank you for such an unspeakable gift that you gave me that day. See how this works? Sometimes in evangelism explosion, we explain that the word grace can be thought of as an acronym. Maybe you've seen this. Grace, G-R-A-C-E, God's riches at Christ's expense. Christ paid for it, but we get to receive by his grace a, the gift of all of God's riches. We also used to say receiving the gift of eternal life is kind of like a beggar receiving a gift from a king. You know, here's the king. He's got everything. Here's the beggar. He's got nothing. And the king can give the beggar a gift, but the beggar can't deserve it. He can't earn it. All he can do is say, thank you. The king's got everything. The beggar has nothing. God's the king. We're the beggars. We can't earn it. We can just say, thank you. But stay with me here. Sometimes we have to remind ourselves that this wonderful grace that God is lavishing upon us, pouring out upon us, is not just a thing for the moment we first place our trust in Jesus. Obviously, it is for that moment. But it's not just for our justification. It's not just for our salvation. His grace is being poured out on us day by day by day, day after day after day throughout our lives so that we can bring him glory. Paul says he's received grace. Look at verse 5 again. He's received this grace to bring about the obedience of faith for the sake of his name among all the nations. You may remember Paul wrote to the Corinthians about the incredible visions God had given him. Remember this chapter in chapter 2 Corinthians chapter 12, how God had given him what Paul calls a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan, angel of Satan, to buffet him in order to keep him from spiritual pride. You remember this? And Paul wrote how he prayed for the Lord to remove that thorn. And God kept saying no. And then God said this, Paul said, but he said to me, my grace, my grace is sufficient for you. For my power is made perfect in your weakness, Paul. Therefore, I will boast, Paul said, all the more gladly of my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. You, you get what God's saying? God's grace was not just for Paul's initial salvation. It was for his entire life. And God said, my grace is sufficient for you, Paul, to you to carry on this work in spite of the thorn you'd like to get rid of. In fact, the truth is, you could probably say not in spite of the thorn, because of the thorn. Because the thorn kept Paul useful to God. It kept Paul from pride, spiritual pride. It kept him humble. That's the way God works. The writer of Hebrews writes this, Let us then, with confidence, draw near to the throne of grace, there it is, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. That is an ongoing prayer for Christians. It's not just a prayer for salvation. It's not just a prayer for an initial conversion. That's the grace to get through life. All of our times of need, all of our life crises, all of the tough decisions we have to make, all the difficulties we go through, all the pain we have to endure. We need God's grace, and God gives it to us. A little later in this letter to the Romans, Paul wrote this to describe our current life in Christ. He said that as sin reigned in death, even so grace might reign through righteousness to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. It's in Romans chapter 5. You know what he's saying? Grace is reigning. 
grace is reigning in our lives. It's in control. It's like Lord of our lives. Chapter 6, for sin shall not be master over you, for you're not under law, but under what? Grace. Grace. It's like grace is Lord of our lives. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ in charge of us, in control of us. He pictures grace reigning over us. We are under grace. That's a lifelong joy we have in Christ to be under his reign, to be under his control, the control of his amazing grace. Did you notice also in Romans 1 verse 5 that the words, the obedience of faith through whom we've received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith for, his, for the sake of his name? Let's think about that for just a minute. This is really important. <laughs> Most of us Baptists hold to a very precious Bible doctrine that sometimes we call by different names. Usually we call it the security of the believer. I'm fine with that terminology. There's nothing wrong with that. It's often popularly called, you may have heard these words, once saved, always saved. And that's true if we understand what it means. Some of the old Puritans and some of the earlier Baptist leaders would call it the perseverance of the saints. The perseverance of the saints. I like that because it communicates more of the truth about our salvation. True Christians are those who, we don't have time to go into a lot of detail here, but true Christians are those who, by God's grace, by the fact that God enables us to do this, we persevere to the end. We don't quit. We don't give up. We don't leave the battle. Sometimes we Baptists have been caricatured, <laughs> you probably you may have run into this too, by those who do not hold this doctrine, this precious doctrine to us. And they'll say, we Baptists claim that all you have to do is say a prayer. And that means you're good to go. You're saved forever and ever, even if you go out and live for the devil. <laughs> Obviously, that's not what we teach. But listen, guys, I have known people who actually call themselves Baptists, who actually seem to believe that. I've known people who said, well, yeah, I'm, I'm paraphrasing them, but they're saying, yeah, I'm, I'm living in sin. I know God's not pleased with my lifestyle right now, but it's okay. You know, I, I trusted Jesus when I was a kid. Once saved, always saved, right? I'm good to go. There's no problem here. <laughs> they're deceived. <laughs> so while it's true, if we really trust Jesus, we receive a salvation that really is eternal. And, we, and God wants us to rest in that security. It's, it's important to us. It's one of the things that helps us overcome Satan, you know, the helmet of salvation, security of, of the believer. Our salvation is eternal. But it's also true that those who truly trust Jesus are transformed. We're transformed into new creatures, new creations. Our whole attitude towards sin has changed. We now feel about sin like Jesus feels about sin. We know it's deadly. We hate sin. Now, we are weak and we fall into it, but we hate it. If we've trusted Jesus, we've repented of sin, right? Our direction's been changed. And as we're going to learn in Romans chapter 6, we're not slaves to sin anymore. There was a time when we could we almost had the excuse, well, I, the devil made me do it. <laughs> we were slaves to sin. We were bound to sin. But a genuine Christian has been set free from that. We'll see that more clearly as we work through Romans. A genuine Christian wants to bring God glory. A genuine Christian is indwelt by God's Holy Spirit, and he enables us to live a life of obedience toward God. Genuine faith leads to obedience. James said it this way. Someone will say, you have faith, and I have works. Show me your faith apart from your works, and I'll show you my faith by my works. You believe that God is one, you do well. Even the demons believe and shudder. Do you want to be shown, you foolish person, that faith apart from works is useless? What's he saying? His point is, true, genuine faith that saves will lead to and result in a life of good works. The good works don't earn the salvation. They are a result of it. Jesus gave us a beautiful illustration of this in John chapter 15. This is like the vine and the branches parable he gave us. You remember this? Look at verse 4. He said, abide in me. And I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. And in verse 5, he said, I am the vine. You are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. 
For apart from me, you can do nothing. You hear what Jesus is saying? Very clear. When we, by faith, become attached to Jesus, it's like a branch attached to a vine. The vine produces the fruit through the branch. Jesus produces fruit through us. This is the obedience of faith Paul's talking about. Without the vine, the branch can do nothing. Without Jesus, we can do nothing. The analogy is perfect. It's a beautiful illustration. John 15. Then Paul adds the words, for the sake of his name. Verse 5, through whom we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith for the sake of his name among all the nations. So let's think about that for a minute. God wants us to know that we can't be saved by our own good works. We can't fix our own sin problem by trying to improve ourselves. We are dependent, not just a little dependent, totally dependent, totally dependent on his grace. You remember the passage we looked at in 2 Corinthians chapter 12? Let's look at that one more time. I talked about that earlier about Paul's thorn in the flesh. Verse 7, so to keep me from being con coming conceited because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, a thorn was given me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to harass me, to keep me from becoming conceited. Three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, that it should leave me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, Paul said, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Now, I wanted you to see and hear those words. We talked about that earlier, but I want you to make sure you hear what Paul's saying here. Paul tried to tell the Lord that he thought he himself would be much more effective in his ministry for the Lord if the Lord would just take away the thorn that kept him so weak. And the Lord says, you just don't understand, Paul. My strength is made perfect in your weakness. When I use you with all your weakness, it becomes clear that I'm the one doing it, Paul, not you. That way, I, the Lord, will get the glory, not you, Paul. You know I'm doing it. I know I'm doing it. Other people will know I'm doing it. Do you remember what people said about Paul's speaking ability? I don't know if you've ever noticed this or not. It's in 2 Corinthians chapter 10. But Paul said, they say about me, his letters are weighty and strong, but his bodily presence is weak and his speech is of no account. New American Standard says his presence is unimpressive and his speech contemptible. <laughs> you know what he's saying? He said, my physical appearance my speaking ability, not that impressive. And yet when we think of the Apostle Paul, we think of this incredibly powerful man, right? <laughs> but he's powerful only because Jesus is in Paul. Not because of Paul, not because of who he is, because of Jesus. And Paul came to that understanding. He finally said, I had to count all the stuff I once thought was making me great. I had to count all that stuff as dung. It, it was garbage. It was trash. So Paul would say, no, 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 no. I'm not an incredibly powerful man. I'm not. But I do have an incredibly powerful Christ living in me. So Christ gets the glory, Paul would say, not me. You remember when God trimmed Gideon's forces from 32,000 to 300? You know why he did that, right? They were facing an enemy of 135,000 Midianites. Why did God trim? I mean, 32,000, that'd still be pretty great victory, wouldn't it? 135,000 to 32,000? <laughs> Who would go to war like that? And yet God said, no, I want you to trim it down even more. And he finally got him down to 300. Why? Because God wanted everybody concerned, including us, when we read his word today, to realize Gideon did not have what it took to win that battle. No way could Gideon, Gideon win that battle. Only God could have done it. God gets all the glory. It's very clear. God wants all of us to know all of us, that he, by his grace, by his grace, will use any of us, any of us who are putting our trust in him. But he will use us in such a way that we will know for certain that not we, but he gets all the glory. He's the one giving us grace to be useful to him. It's not us. And God delights to do things through his kids in such a way that we know <laughs> we couldn't do it on our own. We know God's doing it through us. Other people can look at the situation, and when they know the whole story, they may at first think we're something pretty awesome, but then they get to know us, and they get to know God, and they realize, whoa, only God could do this. God's the one giving the grace. God's working through his kids. 
That's the way it always is. The most encouragement you can give another believer, I believe personally, God wants us to encourage each other, is to say God's really using you. When you notice God using someone, let them know that you realize that's what's happening. God is using you. Give God the glory. Finally, in verse 5, notice this should be done among all the nations. Did you see that? Through whom we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith for the sake of his name among all the nations. Among all the nations. The Greek word is ethnos, usually translated Gentiles in the New Testament. The point, of course, is not just for Jews. Oh, yes, God did choose the Jews to be his chosen people, but he chose them because he was going to use them to make his fame known abroad to all the nations. A lot of the Jews didn't get that very well, but that's why he chose them. Now look at verse 6. Including you who are called to belong to Jesus Christ, to all those in Rome who are loved by God and called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So in verse 5, when Paul talked about bringing about the obedience of faith for the sake of his name among all the nations, here in verse 6 he says, that includes you, you Romans, <laughs> you Gentiles in Rome. And he's using a really important word here. He uses it twice in verse 6 and 7 that we need to spend a little time on, I think. And it's the word called. You see it? Called. It really has two meanings. For example, when Holly or any other preacher gets up to preach, he will usually urge people at some point to respond to an invitation to trust Jesus. He is calling people to come to Jesus. Sometimes we call that an external call. It goes out to anyone who can hear the voice of the preacher. But we also find in the Bible, when we study this word carefully, that God uses this word to refer to something he's doing on a very individual, a very personal level inside our hearts. God does something very powerful inside of us that he describes as his call to us. And what he's doing is sometimes we don't realize it until later after it's all over, but he's supernaturally drawing us toward himself. It's a work God does in our hearts. So back in verse 1, as we saw, Paul is called to be an apostle. Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God. In verse 6, he says, including you who are called to belong to Jesus Christ. You are called. And in verse 7, he says, to all those in Rome who are loved by God and called, called to be saints. And later, he gives us this very famous passage in chapter 8. You're probably familiar with it. And we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called. There it is again. To those who are called according to his purpose. For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. And whom he predestined, these he also called. And whom he called... These he also justified, and whom he justified, these he also glorified. So it's a pretty important word in the Bible. Look at what he writes in chapter 9, verse 23. In order to make known the riches of his glory for vessels of mercy, which he has prepared beforehand for glory, even us whom he has called. There it is again. Not from the Jews only, but also from the Gentiles. And look at what he wrote to the Corinthians. God is faithful by whom you were called into the fellowship of his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. A little later in the same chapters, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, Paul wrote this. But we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews, folly to Gentiles, but to those who are called. There it is again. Those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. And look at this. A couple of verses later, same chapter, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 26. For consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. So this takes us back to the truth that God calls those of us who he knows and we know we're weak. <laughs> when people don't realize they're weak, they have to come to that. We, we have to come to that. Otherwise, we'll never trust Jesus. We think we can handle life on our own. <laughs> God knows we're weak. 
Why is, does he call people who are weak? Because we are weak. It's just the truth. We're weak. He's the one who's strong. And when we realize we're weak and he knows we're weak and others know we're weak, he gets the glory. People are less likely to get confused about what's happening when God does things through weak people. You see, all points back to him. Now, there may be some who would say, well, well okay, that's kind of fine and good. I think I understand yeah, from the scriptures what this calling is about. But how can I know if I really am being called to Jesus in this sense? By the way, in the Gospel of John, we find Jesus using another word, which means the same thing. He uses the word draw, God drawing. Or draw. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. So God draws us, God calls us. How does that work in practice, in reality, in, in, in just real life? Well, generally the process is something like this. Maybe some variations. Somebody hears the truth about Jesus. They hear the gospel. And as they hear, now a lot of people can hear, but as when some people hear, something inside says, this is true. This person may have heard it many times before, and it just kind of went off like water off a duck's back. But all of a sudden, something inside said, this is true. I know it's true. And I know I have a horrible sin problem. And I know I need God's forgiveness. I need what only Jesus can give me. Lord Jesus, I'm coming to you. <laughs> I'm confessing my sins. I'm trusting you and only you. You're my only hope, Lord Jesus. When that sort of thing begins to happen, may use a little different wording, but whether we realize it or not, God is doing something in our hearts. He's drawing us to himself. God's working in our hearts. He's calling us. And he uses all kinds of circumstances, guys. I mean, he can use different messages. He can use different Bible studies. He can use one-on-one -on -one conversations. He can use something you pick up and read. He can use speaking to you based on something you've already heard in the middle of the night. God is drawing. God is doing something in our hearts. He draws our, us to him. So here in verse 7, he says, To all those in Rome who are loved by God and called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. These are people in what was by far the largest city in the world at that time, by far the most powerful city in the world, by far the most important city in the world at that time, city of Rome. And God has dipped down into Rome and loved these people and called them to himself. We really don't know the details of how God did that. Paul didn't establish a church at Rome. He hadn't even been there yet, remember? God used other Christians to establish a church, probably shortly after the coming of the Holy Spirit on that first day of Pentecost, after Jesus had risen from the dead and ascended into heaven. I talked about this some a few months ago. We did an overview of the first few chapters of Romans. If you want to go back and check that out, you may. I'm not going to try to repeat all of that. But in any case, we know there were some strong house churches there in Rome with some pretty mature Christians living in Rome when Paul wrote this in 56 AD when Paul was in Corinth. Paul's letting them know that they're obviously loved by God and they're called to be saints. Now, there's another word we need to talk about for a minute. We don't want to get tripped up here by that word. The word in the Greek for saints is hagios, hagios. And it simply refers to anybody that belongs to Jesus. It comes from the word that means holy in the sense of being set apart or separated out from the world could be translated set apart ones if you wanted to. Unfortunately, there's some confusion about the word in our day, largely because of the practice of the Roman Catholic Church through the centuries of conferring what it calls sainthood on certain Christians. It's, it's like a title that they give to certain Christians. They're saints, and, it's, and they're some kind of special, special, special Christians. So today, we tend to separate Christians into two groups. One group is made up of ordinary folks, like you and me. The other group are the saints, the really extraordinary Christians, the really super Christians, <laughs> some Christians who've done some great deeds of great virtue. And then, to make matters worse, you know what they've done? Many people anyway, I'm not saying all, but many Christians, will, they'll, they'll recognize these other Christians of the past as saints, and they'll see them as highly exalted, and they begin to give them a kind of veneration. Some of them even pray to these people, and it approaches a kind of worship that should be done, given to God alone. And obviously, we shouldn't be praying to anybody but God alone. We pray to the Father through the, through the Son. 
So there's a lot of confusion about the word saint, and we definitely want to avoid that confusion. But as we read the scriptures carefully, we see the word is simply a synonym for any believer, any follower of Jesus is a saint. All of us Christians have been set apart from the world, and we belong to Jesus. We're saints. Paul says something similar to the Corinthians that he said here to the Romans. And by the way, the Christians at Corinth were very, very immature Christians. <laughs> Just read through 1 Corinthians. You'll see it's very clear. They had a lot of growing to do, a lot of things they had to get right. They were not super saints, <laughs> not super Christians. But he says, to the church of God that is in Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints. They're saints, even though they were very immature. And then look at what he asked to that, called to be saints, together with all those who in every place call upon the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, both their Lord and ours. Everybody that calls upon the Lord Jesus Christ, no matter where we are, we're saints. All those in every place, we call upon the name of the Lord, we're saints. <laughs> Romans chapter 8, we read, He who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. Now, the Spirit just, doesn't just intercede for the super-Christians. It's all believers. We're all saints. Well, finally, in verse 7, the last verse of this amazing introduction to the book of Romans, we have Paul's standard greeting. We see this in most all of his letters. I guess all of his letters, something similar to it. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. As I understand it, Greek-speaking people, and Greek, of course, was the common language all over the Roman Empire. Wherever you went, you'd find people who could speak Greek. They commonly greeted each other with the word grace. Jews commonly greeted each other with the word peace. You're probably familiar with that. You remember the Hebrew word for peace? Shalom. You may have heard Jewish people greet each other, shalom. So in a way, Paul is being gracious to both groups, to both Jews and Gentiles using their customary greetings. But of course, Paul's a Christian, and he's writing to Christians, and these words have a lot more power and meaning than just being another variation of Gomer says, hey, you know, he's not just saying, hey there, guys. No, this greeting is a prayer for these Roman Christians. Paul knows that both grace and peace are gifts from God. And he's praying that they will experience God's grace as they live out their lives. We've talked about that. And also the peace of God, which he tells us in another place, passes all understanding as they live out their lives. And this might be a good time to just briefly talk about the two different ways the word peace is used in the Bible. We need to make sure we understand the difference between these two ways. They're both very important. The Bible speaks of peace with God and the Bible speaks of peace of God. In Romans chapter 5, Paul's going to write a little bit later from where we are here. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Peace with God. In verse 10 of chapter 5, he wrote this. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more now that we are reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. The point I want to recognize there is that we were enemies. Because most people who have not yet trusted Christ, they don't really feel like they're enemies of God. That's not how they see themselves as an enemy of God. Most of them don't. Some do. Some do. But in Romans chapter 8, he says, look, the mind that's set on the flesh, that is unbelievers, is hostile to God. It's an enemy of God. It doesn't submit to God's law. Indeed, it can't, he said in Romans chapter 8, verse 7. You see, before we come to Christ, we are enemies of God because by our very nature, we live in sin. We're slaves of sin. We're living selfish, all about me lives. It's all about me. And of course, the world we're living in encourages that as if it's a good thing. God says, no, 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 no. You've got to repent of that. What, what that means is we've got another God in our lives. I myself, I am my own God until I come to Jesus. That gets, puts me in competition with the true God. I'm an enemy of God. I'm trying to compete with him for Godship, for Lordship. It also makes me very foolish. And when the Spirit begins to work in my heart and helps me see who I am and begins to call me, I begin to realize I've been in rebellion against the true God. I need to be reconciled to the true God. I've been an enemy of God. That's what Jesus did for me on the cross. He paid for my sins so that through him I can be reconciled to God. I can have peace with God. We'll talk more about that when we get to chapter 5. But God also knows that this life for us is a lifelong war. 
he intended it to be that way because he's preparing us for eternity. And he intends for us to stay in the battle, to persevere. It's very easy for us in this war to be beset with anxieties and worries and fears and stress and discouragement and dread and depression. You want to fill in some more blanks? <laughs> because of our circumstances. And so over and over again, God says, look, I'm giving you my peace in the midst of that storm you're in, in the midst of those circumstances, the peace of God to resist that discouragement. So Jesus said, for example, these things I've spoken unto you that in me you might have peace, the peace of God. In the world you shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. And then Paul wrote this to the Philippians. Do not be anxious about anything. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And look, the peace of God, the peace of God, which passes all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. So we come to Jesus for salvation because we need peace with God. And we come to Jesus over and over and over and over again after we've been justified, after salvation, because we realize we need the peace of God. <laughs> and I think here in Romans chapter 1, he's primarily thinking about the peace of God. So he's saying grace to you and peace, the peace of God that comes from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. It's a wonderful prayer, isn't it? Let's pray for it right now. Father, thank you so much for this powerful passage of Scripture. Thank you for these powerful truths you're giving us here in this introduction to this awesome book of Romans. And Lord, we do pray that for ourselves. We pray that for our friends and family members. We pray that that they may find grace to help in time of need and that we may find grace. And Lord, that we may find your peace that passes all understanding. And Father, the people we love who don't even know you yet, may they find peace with you. May they realize they're at war with you. They're trying to be their own God and they're throwing and flaunting them, their, themselves in your face. Lord, help them to realize that they need to repent, draw them and call them, we pray, so they can come to you. And I pray, Lord, that you grant them that peace with you, reconcile to you through Jesus. And then, Lord, for your believers, our brothers and sisters who are struggling with different kinds of problems and, and, and difficulties and pain, tribulations in this, this life, Lord, I pray you'd help us all to find that peace that only you can give, the peace of God that passes understanding, your perfect peace, which the world can't give us, only Jesus and Lord, we pray that we'll find that peace and just live in that peace and in that abundant, abounding grace that you're willing to pour out on us day by day as we walk through this life. Help us, Lord, to learn these lessons well, to keep our focus on you, to bring you lots of glory. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.